Today, I'm going to be talking about the PSC and why I care about it as a healthcare professional and why I think it's reasonable for you guys to care about it too. Um, this is a pretty big picture overview um, because there are a lot of minutia that are would take a long time to get into, but I think just the idea of the PSE is kind of confusing. Um, and so this is just sort of to de demystify the idea of the PSC. Okay, well, and I really feel like working with the PSC is about getting a seat at the table with decision makers. So my new subtitle is getting a seat at the table for Wisconsin decarbonization, because I think that's really the best opportunity that we have for a variety of different reasons, which I'll get into more. So, there we go. So just some basics on how electric utility, electric utilities work, generally speaking. We've got a couple of different options for how households or uh, businesses obtain their electricity. Um, one is cooperatively owned utilities, and these are member owned, not-for-profit utilities. They're by far the most common in rural areas, and their goal is to optimize the benefits for their member consumers. So they care a little bit about how much money they make, but they're also the consumers that use the electricity. So there are a variety of interests at play if the utility where you're getting your electricity from is a co-op. Another option is a public utility, and these are federal, state, or municipal run utilities, and their goal is to optimize benefits for their local customers and consumers, right? So this is gonna be, um, I think municipal is gonna be the most common. Um, there, I don't, there are no federal level electricity utility providers, um, but this is a model that happens in some sort of smaller areas. Again, a little bit more rural. Investor owned utilities are how the majority of Americans receive their electricity. They are actually, it's not actually the majority of um, electricity providers that are out there. If you're really looking at sort of number of companies, you're gonna see a lot more co-ops and public utilities. Um, but these investor owned utilities are enormous. And so this is actually where most electricity is being sort of pushed through to the consumer. These are private companies owned by stakeholders and their goal is to optimize return on investment for their stakeholders, right? And the other way to say that is that their goal is to make money, um, right? This is not about their customers or their consumers, right? Their number one goal is related to the people who run the company that provide the electricity. So those are sort of the three main ways that electricity might be generated and provided in terms of who owns the electricity. So the other way you can divide up electricity is whether a market is deregulated or regulated. So deregulated electricity markets mean that the utilities are prohibited from generation and transmission ownership um, at the same time. So um, the utility company is responsible for distribution or operations from the point of the grid being interconnected to the meter. Um, and they're in charge of billing rate payers. So functionally what that means is that they don't make the energy. They're just in charge of getting the energy that has been made to the consumer in terms of like who you're paying your bill to. And then there's a separate set of folks who are making the electricity. And this allows for market competition for retail energy supply to customers. So right, if you really want to work with somebody who is generating 100% electric energy, you have more of an opportunity to engage with that particular supplier um, instead of sort of being stuck with a monopoly, which is what you have under a regulated electricity market. So these are vertically integrated utilities. Right? They control the flow of electricity from the moment it's made to it getting to the grid, to it getting to the meter at the end of the grid into your home from start to finish. And these utilities have a monopoly over their customers. And all of this is so that the companies can have economies of scale that makes the electricity cheaper overall. But they're monopolies, right? I can only get from MG&E when I move to Milwaukee. I'm only able to get from We Energies. It doesn't matter what I want or whether I think that they're an evil company or a nice company or whatever else, I'm stuck with what I got. Um, and that's because they own everything from beginning to end. There's no way for me to engage with the grid in, with any other company. All right, so it's sort of your big difference 
it can you sort of change your electricity based on just deciding to get the electricity from a different provider um, because you like their ethics, their mission, um, whether they're an investor or a utility, a co-op, or do you like their energy mix like solar or coal or gas versus a regulated electricity market where you really have no control um, over what's happening unless you change the regulation. And in, the, in Wisconsin, that regulating body is the PSC or the Public Services Commission. That is the group that is in charge of, sort of everything that changes how a regulated electricity provider works. Um, so the majority of Wisconsin's remaining coal generating capacity is owned by IOUs. So that's Elm Road, which is owned by We Energies mostly, and Weston, which is owned by WPS mostly. We do still have Magit, which is owned by Dairyland Co-op, which is a co-op. And then the Manitowoc is a municipally owned and itty bitty tiny, technically very difficult to close. Basically the way that it's connected up to the grid makes it impossible for it to shut down simply. Um, so we don't think about that one very much. Um, but yeah, so the majority of Wisconsin's remaining coal generating capacity is owned by IOUs. And Wisconsin has a regulated utility market, like I said, where the PSE is the regulator, right? So we're thinking back about what that means for trying to get utilities to get off of coal, consumers can't use free market forces to drive changes in utility operations, right? By saying, I'm gonna, you know, you better change your ways or I'm gonna go to XYZ person who uses solar instead. Um, and because they are investor owned and they are um, beholden to their sh shareholders, any changes that improve anything other than increasing their return on investment really has to come from regulation because they're not supposed to like legally really make any changes that don't ultimately benefit their return on investment. So that's sort of general basics about how utilities work, broadly speaking, or what it means in Wisconsin and um, what the PSC does. The PSC is made up of three members. They're each appointed by the governor for a six year term. And they're supposed to ensure safe, reliable, affordable, and environmentally responsible utility services. Uh, they are specifically required for issuing stocks or bonds related to utility companies, major construction projects, and the setting of new rates. There are three members, like I said, Rebecca, but I don't actually know how to pronounce her last name, embarrassingly, but she is uh, the head of the PSC right now. She was appointed by Governor Evers. Ellen Nowak is the one member who's left over from the previous administration. And Tyler Hubner is the newest sort of uh, appointed member, but he hasn't been officially approved by uh, the Wisconsin Senate and Assembly. Um, this is important because he was a member of Clean Wisconsin. He is a huge proponent for clean energy, but he is not an official member of the PSC yet. And so if you are uh, watching closely with what kinds of votes he's making, they may seem a little bit more conservative than you might expect from somebody with his background. And it very likely may be because he's worried that he won't get appointed if he makes too many waves. And unfortunately, there are a lot of appointees that haven't been approved. And so it's not clear how quickly slash whenever that will officially come through the pipeline. So the other thing that's important about the PSC uh, is how it fits into nonprofit operations, given that WHPCA is a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and that has a lot of implications for what kinds of things we can do. So in case anyone's not well-versed in that, so 501c3s are sort of the most common, most popular nonprofit organization designation for taxes, um, and they are prohibited from substantial lobbying. Um, so we can do a little bit of lobbying, but it can't represent more than 10 to 20% of our activities or consume any more than 10 to 20% of the resources of the organization. And in this circumstance, lobbying involves any decision maker who is elected or any decision that will be voted on. So this rules out actions that target legislators, governors, any specific pieces of legislation or any specific ballot initiatives or anything else that falls into that voted on or using a decision maker who is voted in. 
the PSC is appointed by the governor, as I mentioned previously, um, and though the three of them vote on their final decisions, um, it's not considered sort of the, the lobbying in the sense of the, what the government cares about. So they're fair game for 501c3. So that means it's sort of safe and comfortable as a way for us to engage in change. Um, and also a lot of grants will want us to use this, uh, sort of stick to these requirements um, for 501c3. We have at least sort of made you convinced that the PSC is helpful from a trying to get things done perspective because they're really the only ways that we can force utilities specifically to change their ways. And also they're sort of a safe way to engage with um, state level change from a money perspective. So then the question is, all right, so how do we actually do this? And um, the PSC engages, the, the way that they function is through dockets. And there are a variety of different ways that they sort of set up their dockets and sort of different categories of them. Um, one of the most common ones is gonna be approving new energy generation facilities. So right now that's mostly solar and natural gas, right? We put the kibosh on coal. I don't think that's coming up anymore. There's not a lot of wind going on right now, but there is some that will pop up. Um, so this is really what we're thinking about looking for at the moment. And then also they approve any other major construction. Those are some of the other ones that are coming up now are mostly natural gas storage infrastructure. There are a handful of dockets related to that coming up in the next year. Um, rate cases are the other really big docket. And Anne, that's where you would perhaps be able to intervene. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, but that, yeah, I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then there's sort of other, and that's just for anything else that can be related to regulation of utility operations or infrastructure. And I would put the roadmap to zero carbon into this. If any of you have seen that sort of pop in through your inbox that the sort of, uh, Everybody that our two Evers appointees agreed to move forward with this. And um, uh, if this had not been an Evers appointed group, it probably wouldn't have happened. But the PSC has now decided that they are going to review how our electricity utilities are planning to decarbonize um, by 2050. Are those plans appropriate, fast enough, and reasonable, and also appropriate to consumers? all under the auspices of the uh, governor's task force for climate change. So that is a different one, right? It wasn't sort of like put forth by somebody else. They're not approving something. It's they more or less decided to do it themselves, which is sort of a special corner case. It doesn't pop up nearly as much. Um, but I will spend a little bit of time on rate cases because these are what I think of as the bread and butter of the PSC because this was really the place that we could intervene to try to get coal plants shut down. Um, and be sort of exactly for the reasons that you're talking about, Anne, like there are lots of things where it seems like they don't have jurisdiction um, because there's no specific infrastructure that's being voted on or other sorts of sort of key regulatory pieces. But when it comes to a rate case, the utility has to get the the PSC to agree that their operations as a whole are appropriate, usually for the next two years. And so this is a place where people can come in and say, your goals for your rates, which is why it's called a rate case, because um, often they're asking to increase rates, um, but also just general operations are not appropriate and we think that they should be changed. Um, so this is sort of how you make any changes that aren't related to other specific infrastructure dockets. So the way that a rate case goes, um, which is very similar to other dockets, so you, utility files an application with the PSC for their proposed upcoming rates and operations, or maybe for a specific piece of infrastructure. Um, then the PSC staff audits the utility's financial records, their forecasts, their proposals, everything that they're planning on doing for the upcoming, like I said, typically two years. And then the PSC solicits some amount of public participation. Um, there's always going to be a formal trial type hearing where people can be official interveners. Um, but then there are other ways to engage public comments and possibly live public input sessions. And then the commissioners review all of that evidence that was obtained up above and uh, come to a publicly stated opinion on the case. So the timeline for these things is sort of generally consistent. Um, and like I said, there's the application 
there's the audit, there's comments um, filed by the public, the party session, which is that formal trial type hearing. And then the public session actually usually happens at the same time as the party session. Um, so I'll sort of talk about a little bit more of the details of both of all of that. So there are three main places where you can think about intervening, or I shouldn't use the term intervening, think about trying to influence the decision that the PSC comes to over the course of a docket. The easiest one is the filed comments one. So that's public written comments via mail or website. Um, so low input, low effort, probably pretty low reward also. Um, but this is a place where you can spam out your followers, put them on Facebook, put on whatever, like please you know, come and write a message to the PSC in favor of the solar farm or uh, with this suggestion about how we want to change somebody's operations, you know, sort of generally speaking, right, you're trying to get a groundswell of support. Um, one complication here is that the um, Sierra Club used to try to streamline this process because the PSC website is absolutely atrocious, possibly intentionally in order to prevent public from uh, giving uh, input, hard to say, um, but so we used to accumulate everything and then hand it over to the PSC during the party session. And they have now said that that is not appropriate for a variety of different reasons, um, that it's not secure, that we can't prove that it's individual people, et cetera, et cetera, sort of as we counteract each of their specific sort of legal arguments, they still fall back on this, like it's not appropriate. So um, at least for the short, short term, all of these public written comments are gonna have to come from individual people um, with assisted navigation of the PSC system. So the next sort of next level of investment are the telephone or in-person public sessions. Um, so they've all been remote during COVID um, and they do them all by telephone. They don't do WebEx or Zoom or anything else that would be reasonable. Um, Joel Charles was at one of them and was uh, appropriately confused. Oh my God, it was so hard. <laughs> it's like, if we can't figure it out, right? Enfranchised physicians, um, and I had to sort of like text him to get him through it, right? This is not an accessible way. Um, but the suggestion when we think about how to influence policy is always that sort of hearing people speak is more impactful than written words. Hard to say exactly how true that is, um, but it is another way for people. It's a really to good involved. point because, sorry to interrupt. Because no, my reaction, my reaction to that case was, that third party case was about low income people being able to get um, access to renewables. And my main reaction to it was there were no low income people, as far as I could tell, commenting. And at first, I thought that was the failure of the people organizing commentary. But I suppose it could have also been from the like profound inaccessibility of the format. Yeah, I think profound inaccessibility is a theme when it comes to trying to engage with the PSC. Um, so yeah, you have to know the phone number, you have to like generally speaking know how it works, you have to know that you're like gonna be on hold and they're gonna unmute you and remute you. And it's even I knew what was coming and I was still exceptionally awkward when I gave my testimony at that particular docket. Um, but you know, it's often very reinforcing for people who are there. You get to hear other people be sort of inspired and articulate and impassioned. I heard a lot of people say really positive things about Joel's testimony. So that part of it feels really nice. Um, and then you can also stay around because like I said, it's almost always happening sort of in tandem with the party session. And part of the party session is public. And so you can hear a little bit of the sort of legal bickering that happens at the party session, um, which is also a nice opportunity. My guess is once we go to a post-COVID era, these are gonna go back to being in person, which will make them even more inaccessible than they were previously, right? When I, I can, if I'm lucky, if I have sort of space between patients can pop out and do a telephone um, testimony and then sort of pop back into a patient if it works out right. Uh, but if it's in person, that's never gonna work out. So that brings us to the party session. So these are formal trial type hearings where you have lawyers and expert witnesses who give expert testimony to give sort of 
really hard concrete evidence that this is the whatever have, whatever your group feels about the PSC and about this docket and how you might change the outcome of the docket in question. And so Anne, this is where you would say, hey, PSC, you're supposed to make sure that the utilities are working on behalf of the customers that they serve, this rate case that claim that says that you're going to keep buying from XYZ is no longer appropriate and you should kick them out. So how do you, but, uh, but the utility has to file, we energy would have to file to say that our customers are paying too much to be able no. to get the process? So any time, so every two years, every utility company has to say, this is what my operations are going to be for the next two years. And so all of that information is available, who exactly they're buying things from, what they're buying from, how they're going to use it, and what that means for their rates. Okay. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what our intervening has looked like in the past and how that could be similar. Um, so this is where you're really hard hitting, right? This is where you have a seat at the table. This is where the Sierra Club has sat down in particular, right? Columbia was the plant that I was the most involved with. And really, you know, like you get to know the executives or at least their lawyers um, and do a lot of back and forth. And then this is sort of why we ended up being the group that sat down with Columbia or sat down um, with not MG, whatever. The people who ended up closing it, I'm blanking right now, um, and Alliant um, and came up with an agreement with them sort of based on the conversations that had been had in the rate case. So yeah, specifically for Columbia, um, the big thing here was really about money. The Columbia coal plant is not very economic. Uh, we could make a really good argument that if they're supposed to be doing best by their rate payers in order to minimize rates, which is one of the things that they're supposed to be doing, that closing Columbia was the right thing to do. Um, so that was really the main argument that was made in those party type hearings, right? We have investigated your, your plans for your rates, how much you're paying for the fuel in Columbia and how much it pays to run it, what you're having to do to keep up maintenance, et cetera, et cetera. And we have expert testimony that says if you shut down Columbia, then it will be cheaper for your rate payers in the long term. Um, and there was also a lot of grassroots campaigning, which was that I was personally more sort of like intimately involved in to put external pressure on Alliant and MG&E to say, we don't want this. It's not what your rate payers want. Please get rid of this um, to just put sort of that external validation in. on the outside, which is, you know, sort of at least like potentially a, an important role for the public comments to say like, this is true also from the outside, from people who are paying for the rates. Um, so that is the opportunity for you to look at a funding stream, look at operations and say, this is what you say you're doing. We don't like it. And here's why we can prove that you're not doing the right thing. Um, and you need to change what you're doing for the next two years of operations. Um, Oak Creek, very similar, also not particularly economic and also a ton of grassroots organizing, right? Even more so than for Columbia because there were so many people who lived so close to it who were up in arms about the fact that this plant was still in operation and harming local health and really just not good for the environment or for anybody who was nearby. Um, so again, sort of that combination of, we have expert testimony that says you're uneconomic, you're doing bad by your consumers, get rid of this thing. And then also that external pressure. The Edgewater Generating Station is another PSC sort of success. There was not nearly as much grassroots organizing around Edgewater, and it was a much less economic plant. So we could really just put a lot of pressure saying, this makes no economic sense. How dare you keep this going? Close this thing down as soon as possible, which was then sort of successfully negotiated. So those are sort of like the three big successes over the past year. Um, and this is why I think of the rate case as sort of being the prototype of the docket, but it's certainly not the only thing, but you're generally speaking gonna go through those, like there is a docket, there is some sort of evidence that's been given by the utility, and then you have these opportunities to provide influence in different levels. Um, like I said, we're intervening, which is the term that we use for 
engaging in that party session. Sorry, I should have said that's that's when I say intervening, that's what that means. You have to sign up ahead of time to say we are going to be an intervener in this particular docket. And that means we are engaging in this party session and we are going to provide expert testimony to say that something should either you know keep the status quo or something should be changed. Um, so Victoria, regarding price, very quickly, if we have an expert in energy policy pricing uh -huh. who can say we have plenty of evidence now that renewables and batteries are the cheapest way to generate electricity in, in Wisconsin, then the PSC is obligated to move on that. If we can show definitively science-based that renewables are now the cheaper energy source. Yeah, though there are gonna be expert testimony coming from other people uh, suggesting that that may be true in general, but it's not true in this particular circumstance. Um, and the nitty gritty of what happens when you're an actual intervener is not something I've seen. And we are supposed to have somebody here who ended up not being able to make it, who's gonna do that a little bit more. Um, but you sort of open up the door for me to say that Sierra Club, sort of despite the fact that Clean Wisconsin, Renew, and some other groups have been interveners on these dockets that we've cared a lot about too. And they have generally speaking, sort of over the past five plus years, just sort of signed off and said like, sounds good utility, you're trying your hardest, we believe in you. Um, and in large part, that's because the PSC under Walker was all Walker appointees and really didn't allow any input for anyone else whatsoever, right? There was no, no suggestion that consumers or anyone else really had any say in what conclusion the PSC came to. And so I think there's a little bit of um, sort of feeling like the PSC is not gonna be a great place to put in a lot of effort because of how little change there was. But that's changing dramatically, right? Now we have two out of the three who are very interested in clean energy even if the one who's the most interested is sort of treading on thin ice right now. Um, and even though the Sierra Club was the only one who was pushing Alliant to close Columbia, and there, we were really the only voice in the room that was pushing for that, um, our voice was still loud enough that they decided that they didn't want to deal with it anymore and they were going to like come to us and come up with a negotiation for closure. Go ahead. I was going to say, how do you find out when the, when the, is there some public place on the PSC website we can find out when the, like We Energy is going to be up for auditing? For there the, sure you know? is. Uh -huh. um, it's not easy to find. Okay. Um, there is a list. You can, I can't remember how you get there. I click around for a long time and then eventually you get to upcoming dockets and then it pops up. Okay. I was, I was just going to say, it's important to note that um, interveners oftentimes will coordinate with each other or they're, it's sort of a multidisciplinary team. Um, so there wouldn't be like one rate person from WHPCA. It's usually WHPCA would work with an outside consultant who is already an expert on rate structure for utility companies in order to provide a joint public intervening testimony that would be meaningful for the PSC to render its decision. I guess I'm thinking about the question of what the value added is for a group. And I assume our group's value added isn't really talking about price so much as it is talking about other impacts on the population, mm -hmm. which brings me to the question of, does the PSC have specific sort of instructions in terms of um, what types of information it should be weighing in making these decisions? Like, is it limited just to the question of cost to consumers or do they have leeway to consider other benefits to the public such as like health benefits or harms and equity like to what to what extent like are they allowed to to weigh some of these other other arguments that are sort of more in our wheelhouse yeah so they're supposed to ensure safe reliable affordable and environmentally responsible utility services so I think safe traditionally means we're not electrocuting people, but could also be interpreted more broadly by, a, by an interested PSC, um, potentially by the current PSC. Um, 
And then there's the possibility when we're thinking about sort of future and what opportunities there are for, for things coming up, there's this roadmap to zero, um, which may or may not change the way that the PSE is supposed to engage with things. I mean, it's hard to know really how far reaching the outcome of that docket will be. I'm, it's hard to be optimistic about something like that. I mean, obviously it could be really wonderful where they feel empowered to force utilities to really go zero carbon quickly, but that doesn't seem particularly likely. But whether that means that they, right now we understand that electricity generation has broad impacts and really they should be thinking about other types of data to make their decisions. I don't know. It could right. also depend slightly on this budget session because there's also the social cost of carbon concept that's been introduced. So for those who haven't heard about that, um, that was a piece of the governor's task force report. So it's asking for the PSC to consider the full social cost of their decisions. And so that would very much include health. So depending on how that develops um, over time, that would also be weighed in um, in these cases. Yeah, there are a lot of options for how to engage with the PSC from a health perspective that haven't been done before. Traditionally, safety, I, I actually have never, heard, not that this doesn't exist, but I've never heard anyone talking about like building codes or electrocution, maybe on like the scale of like substations and how those need to be structured. Um, but a lot of regulation also deals with like utility shutoffs and um, how, you know, how, how you can provide what um, utilities to what customers and, and um, those sorts of rate um, those sorts of um, rate decisions. Um, but I don't think that um, climate change has really been brought up um, or the cost of carbon has ever really been brought up at a PSC level in the state. And when you're trying to think of the PSC, it's important to think about that piece that Victoria mentioned about it being a regulated monopoly, right? We are essentially saying these utility companies can have full reign over essentially whatever they want to do in these areas because you are beholden to the PSC because the PSC is acting on the best interest of the citizens that they are going to be providing those um, utility services to. Um, and so when you think about it from that lens, almost as like, you know, they're, they're sort of the regulators or the guardians of this monopoly because they have the power to tell them what to do. That's why the PSC has, is such a great way to, to try and influence change is just because of that basic function that they're supposed to serve. And so then thinking about things that are actually coming up in the next year, we could use the PSC's power to, to make the utility companies do what we want, uh, more or less. So they're starting the remaining coal plants. Like I said, there are four left. And the way that we've been most successful so far is by arguing economics. And for the four that are left, that's gonna be much less successful, which is part of why WHPCA coming in is potentially really helpful, right? We have to change the game in order to get these closed. Um, and like the current systems, the tricks that we've used so far are not gonna be as impactful as they, as they have been in the past. Um, but also probably means when it comes to individual plants, that's not gonna be as helpful. Like I think the specific rate cases that are coming down the line uh, you know, over the next year or two, probably aren't going to be amazing places for intervening, um, other than maybe sort of like understanding what the process looks like. The roadmap to zero is really exciting. It'll be something that'll be really interesting to, yeah, engage with. So I'm very curious what that's going to look like, big picture. Uh, preventing new gas plants, if that's something that we're interested in, is a possibility. And just sort of think about zero carbon futures. Um, because there are multiple that will probably be proposed over the next couple of years. And tech, it's not clear if that one's gonna come back on docket or not. Um, grid standardization, I know something that Andrew cares about a lot and is not a specific docket, but is something that could come up in other, sort of, sort of slip it in in other places, depending on sort of exactly what dockets come up. Fair rates is another one that the Sierra Club and some of the Wisconsin or Milwaukee partners are becoming really interested in, right? So for those of you who don't know, Wisconsin has one of the highest fixed fees related to energy utilization in the country, right? So that means regardless of how much energy you use, you pay X number of dollars. And then you also pay um, 
and a, a rate based on how much energy you consume. And that both disproportionately burdens people who use less energy, who are lower income, and also people who use less energy because they are energy efficient or because they have their own solar panels or whatever else. So it both disincentivizes energy efficiency and um, sort of having your own energy production on your, on your site and also uh, burdens low income individuals. Uh, and Wisconsin has a big problem with inequities in many forms. Um, and this also has direct health tie-ins when you think about heat stroke and other diseases that are related to heat. So this is something that we're really thinking about a lot right now. And again, that would have to be somewhere probably in a rate case um, and because there wouldn't be specific dockets and it's really about rates. Um, and then there's improving commission accessibility. That's another thing that Sierra Club is thinking a lot right now. Like my goodness, if an interested party can't even figure out how to be an intervener, what the heck, um, with help from people who are experienced interveners. And that doesn't even bring up for people giving comments, people calling in, is anything gonna change if we can't actually make them more accountable to the people that they're supposed to be serving? So maybe this is sort of when there's this period of diastole where it's not clear how exactly we're gonna get things closed, do we spend some time working on this? And then sort of, I would say relatively low hanging fruit is supporting renewable projects. So we'll hear lots, especially if you sign up to renew letters, uh, email serves, you'll hear about different solar dockets that are coming up. Um, and those are pretty straightforward to intervene on and pretty straightforward to submit comments to also. But there can also be a lot of local, um, uh, there will be local groups that are not interested in these renewable projects going through. And they are starting to have, it seems like a little bit more organized resistance Right, it's gonna be ugly, it's gonna decrease the property values around the solar field, et cetera. Um, so even though these have, haven't had much organized opposition and have gone through in a fairly straightforward fashion in the past couple of years, that may be changing as they start to pick up speed. So it might be more helpful um, than it has been in the past. So those are sort of general pictures of things that might be useful going forward. Um, because I think there's a lot of opportunity. I think that's everything. What other questions do people have? Did the state have to pay into Alliant when they closed? I mean, was there any kind of negotiations about somebody having to pay in to close that plant? The rate payers are, mm -hmm. are paying for it. And what's going to take its place? Solar. So there's a docket that Alliant has already uh, put forward that's going to cover their portion of Columbia. What would WHPCA or other health groups need to do at this point to meaningfully align with groups to publicly intervene? Um, I mean, I, I bring it up because um, a few years back I brought up the idea or. I, I had heard an idea from somebody at Slipstream. Um, he, he had mentioned that doing something similar to this, bringing in the health perspective would be a good idea. And so then I went to, you know, I maybe should, in retrospect, obviously I should have gone to Sierra Club. Um, but, you know, I went to Clean Wisconsin and Renew um, and there were no takers and they just didn't seem to be interested. Um, yeah, I think, Sierra Club has been frustrated by the lack of sort of like cooperation and communication with this, these three groups that seem like they would be so aligned. Um, so I think understanding what a group strategy would look like, right? There's like, like you said, there's always some amount of like, there's always discussion before you go in the party hearing, right? Everybody's always talking and it is a discussion about what eventually ends up happening, but there hasn't been as much coordination as it seems like you would think there would be given the allied interests. So I think that um, from the Sierra Club's perspective, like if and when WHPCA says we're ready inter to intervene and we want it to be on this docket, we say like, great, let's have a meeting ASAP to understand what your priorities are and how they overlap. 
And also if there's anyone who says like, yes, we want to intervene, but like, where should we even start? What matters? I also sort of know who at Sierra Club would want to talk to you then too. So I think just sort of like understanding what coordination looks like is still a little unclear because there has been less of it than it feels like would be ideal. Yeah, and when I talk to um, the Sierra Club, um, when I talk to EKR, who usually works on a lot of the raid cases, um, she said that if we were to intervene, what they could do um, is they like to have more than one lawyer because it's more impactful. Um, so we would have our own lawyer, but then um, we could ask our lawyer to work hand in hand with their lawyer and then have like joint meetings as a group. So that like, we're debriefing with our lawyers at the same time, um, which saves our lawyers time. And then they can kind of coordinate on different things. Um, so, so it can be done. It just hasn't been done in the past, surprisingly. 